water, earth, air. This is a place where the elements mix and merge, a landscape where plants and animals inhabit more than a single sphere. Birds hunt in the water, while fish glide over green meadows. And land animals often lose the ground under their feet. Fog is an almost constant companion. But just as often, reflections of the sun will gleam up through the canopy. These sprawling woods and tangled waterways are totally intertwined. This could be Amazonia, the Orinoco, or the Rio Paraná. But these wild wetlands are only half an hour's drive from the city of Vienna. The Morava's wooded floodplain is among the last untamed riverscapes in the heart of Europe. Water is life, and life is constant change. Again and again, these waters wield their powers of destruction and new creation. They make the Morava a river without frontiers. There's no river without banks. But the Morava's banks are as movable as the river's rising and sinking waters. No man-made barrier can safely rein them in, and bursting dams have come as sudden reminders of man's vulnerability. Most of the time, the powers of this river remain unnoticed, as long as its high waters lose themselves in the Morava's wide, wooded floodplain. But the regulars know that these woodlands will often take a footpath. Grey lag geese are ground breeders, yet along the Morava River, their nests are found in ancient trees. It's a lesson learned through countless generations. Up here, the nest is not only safe from floods. The tree nest even turns an inundation into a safeguard against foxes and martins. There are years when the meadows are flooded for weeks on end. For the river, these are the years of plenty, when aquatic life is richly replenished. The grass is always greener far from home. For wild carp, this is a fact. Where wildflowers blossom in dry years, carp have their spawning grounds in years of high water. First, the carp arrive on the flooded meadows one by one. Eventually, they congregate in masses. In their courtship, males and females rub their bodies against each other until the females release their eggs. Just a few days later, millions of larvae hatch from these eggs. Coming from Czechia, the Morava River flows along the border between Slovakia and Austria until it reaches the Danube. Its wetlands, swamps and backwaters extend into all three countries.
here, the former Iron Curtain has turned into a green corridor. After the curtain fell, the Border River became a river without borders. When a high-pressure system broods over Central Europe, the Morava's current becomes gentle. The river mirrors what happens in the skies, its flow of water depending on the flow of clouds. This spring, rain clouds are rare. By early summer, the flood plains begin to dry out, but a few stagnant pools are left. As long as there is a connection to the river, carp and other fish can come and go. But once pools are cut off, the fish are trapped. Sinking water levels slowly tighten the noose. Sooner or later, these fish will be an easy meal. Nothing that's good for a meal will escape these noses, and nursing mothers are voracious. Wild boar are omnivores. They find the riverine forest attractive, not only because there's plenty of food, but also because there's such a wide choice. When chewing on fresh fish, the piglets are just imitating their mothers. Their preferred diet is still mother's milk. The mothers have to come up with enormous amounts of milk, so they can't be bothered while eating. Motherly patience has a limit, especially when the stomach's growling. Only a couple of weeks ago, this forest floor was a backwater, but now fresh greenery is sprouting. The young greylag geese have just hatched. Their instinct urges them to join their parents but these are out of reach. To leave a nest at that height takes some courage, especially when you're the first to jump. What's needed is a good example to follow. The parents usher the little ones on. The forest floor is a dangerous place. There's always a risk of a fox or a mountain turning up. The goose family heads straight for the water. Here they feel safe. This is their element. All summer long, the oxbows and swamps will be their nursery. The wetland forest borders on a very different landscape, hot and dry, and quite exotic for Central Europe. These gentle, grass-covered sand dunes along the Lower Morava resemble the steppes of Central Asia. And in fact, this is where many of its inhabitants have come from. The Suslicks only emerged from their winter burrows in late March. So they've only got six months for a full year's worth of living. This could explain why they're such fast movers. Thank you. 
Their courtship and mating, in any case, seem frantic. What looks like an aggressive chase is, in fact, the extended foreplay to a very quick act. He, too, was that fit in his time, but that's a while ago. Done. That was it. Although things happen too fast to be witnessed, the evidence is there. When a Suslik female starts decorating her home, the family is about to grow. This, the second act, may take longer, but it's no less frantic than the first. Susliks live in large colonies, but each animal has its personal burrow. These animals are quite house-proud. In just a few days, the female will give birth and then nurse her litter for six weeks. When you're moving too fast, risks can easily be overlooked. It's only been a few years since Imperial Eagles have been back to hunt along the Morava, and it's easy to see what attracts them. In Austria, the Imperial Eagle had been extinct for two centuries. In Eastern Europe, a few populations survived. Recently, the eagles have begun to spread out westward. A few pairs now breed along the Morava River. With some luck, and this depends on human wisdom, the Imperial Eagle will get another chance to colonize Central Europe. The woodlands along the river are vast and dense. Few people ever disturb this solitude. For wildlife, this green band is a sanctuary. The white stork is among the more impressive inhabitants of the Morava's woods. Like the greylag geese, the white storks nest in old trees. The banks of the Morava are the only place in Europe where they do that. Storks return to the same nest year after year. Here they mate and raise their young. In the distant past, most European storks nested on trees. Then humans cleared more and more woodland. Big old trees that can support their huge nests have become rare in Europe. A stork nest can weigh up to a ton. May on the floodplain. For a few weeks now, the stags have been growing new horns. In earlier days, the red deer would leave the floodplain at this season and migrate to their highland pastures. In autumn, they would return to the lowland rivers. Today, many of their old migration routes are cut off. Spring brings a thousand hues of green. For a while, green seems to be the only colour. But then, wild ducks and little grebes bring in splashes of gaudy colour.
Eventually, patches of Siberian iris begin to glow in the swamps, a splendor that has become extremely rare. The most precious gems are hard to find. The Japanese iris hides in secret corners of the wood. An unspectacular plant and a spectacular butterfly. What brings these two together? The southern festoon has developed a special exclusive relationship with the birthwort plant. In June, the female sticks a few eggs to the downside of birthwort leaves. It's the only plant its larvae are able to eat. One week later, caterpillars hatch from the eggs. During the first weeks of their lives, the caterpillars only eat the tender parts of the plant, especially the petals. By their second molt, they've grown into voracious eating machines. Now, they need a more substantial diet. Once a caterpillar is fully grown, it produces threads of silk to attach itself to a stem. Then the caterpillar sheds its skin. Below it is a soft pupal shell which hardens in the air and will protect the pupa until it's a fully developed butterfly. Summer has come to the floodplain. The young geese are still wearing their baby fluff, although in size they will soon be fully grown. Most of the time, the families keep to themselves, but when feeding on the swampy meadows, several of them mingle. Side by side, adults and young birds of all ages scan the ground for tasty herbs, blossoms and insects. On land, the geese are extremely watchful. The slightest disturbance will send them off towards the water. A fox has broken the idyll, even though he's not even seriously hunting. He just keeps checking whether a young bird is injured or lags behind. A pair of lapwings spied the fox from the air and warned everyone around. The swan is big enough not to fear the intruder. Lowland storms can break out suddenly and discharge enormous energy. Within hours, the water level can rise dramatically. 
Water may be the element of life in the wetland forest, but not all animals here are aquatic. The young imperial eagles are freezing in spite of their mother's protection. But the herons are in their element. A downpour cannot phase them. Heavy rain means flooded fields. As the waters spread, waders find their hunting ground expanding. For the imperial eagle, this is not hunting weather, so the young are in for a time of fasting. Dried up oxbows and channels are filling up again. Hard baked ground is softening. The water brings back life, even to those meadows that had not been reached by the floods in spring. Now the stage is set for a truly ancient spectacle. These are strange creatures from days long gone. It might be their first appearance in years. Tadpole shrimps, or triops, have been around without changing their shape for some 200 million years. Their eggs can survive dry periods, sometimes over decades. But when their patch of ground is flooded, they will hatch within days. And they're not the only bizarre inhabitants of the flooded meadows. Fairy shrimps, dragonfly larvae, water bugs, great diving beetles and other tiny creatures are floating among the wildflowers, adding up to an enormous biomass. It's an abundant feeding ground for tens of thousands of young fish. In rainy years, the swarms of fry are huge. Life in and above the water is closely interwoven. The life cycle of many insects embraces both spheres. Most of the wetland birds feed on aquatic life. Way up in the canopy, the vagrants of the river have their roosts. Night herons are among the Morava's irregular visitors. They do not breed here every year. Night herons hardly ever use a nest in two successive years. For their breeding colonies, these shy birds always try to find new solitary patches of forest. Hunting for fish and amphibians may be tedious for the parents, but it's nothing compared to the actual feeding of the young. Watching young night herons being fed adds a new dimension to the phrase, young and hungry. Before using their wings, the young birds must learn to hold their balance on their feet. Venturing out on a limb is not a good idea before being able to fly. Suddenly, the situation is only funny for the onlookers. But maybe that's the quickest way to learn flying. The height of summer. Just outside the wooded floodplain, the grass on the sand dunes is wilting under a scorching sun. 
Only a few flowers and insects can hold out on the step. Wherever the sand is bare, the temperature is extreme, up to 60 degrees centigrade. And yet, there's life here. The digger wasp feeds on nectar, but to nurture its offspring, it resorts to hunting. Before laying her eggs, the female digs a breeding tunnel. Then the wasp goes hunting for grasshoppers. She takes a few turns to make sure she will remember the location. Her quarry is still alive, but paralyzed. On the paralyzed grasshopper, she will lay her eggs. When they hatch, the larva will feed on their helpless host. The August sun turns the floodplain into a steamy hothouse. The hum of myriads of mosquitoes fills the air. In the reeds, the red deer try to hide from the heat and the mosquitoes. Good wallowing spots are now rare and spurn competition. The biggest boar are always first to chill out. The mud bath is not just refreshing, it's also a shield against menacing insects. Cormorants clearly profit from hot, dry weather. Their feathers get soaked when they fish, and they cannot fly until they are dry. Cormorants are living clotheslines. Birds sit like this for hours, absorbing the warmth of the sun and digesting their meals. At the climax of summer, water becomes scarce even on the floodplain. Sandbanks turn into islands, oxbows into stagnant pools. In these pools, many fish are now trapped. This means luck for the young night herons who have recently left the care of their parents and must now learn to hunt by themselves. Even though the low water level makes hunting easier, there's no such thing as a free meal. But hunger is a great motivator, and the young heron's learning curve is soaring. The oppressive heat only lasts for two or three weeks. By mid-August, the fogs are back in the valley, turning the tropical jungle into a mystical forest.
with the first fogs, the first migratory birds descend. Soon, thousands will follow. But for now, time seems to stand still. The summer is gone, and autumn hasn't really arrived. Nature is gathering strength for the winter. Around the pools, the young herons are gorging themselves with fish. Once the trees change colour and shed their first leaves, the red deer become restive. The rut is imminent. Their rough voices echo through the forest. One can hear them thrashing through the undergrowth. They are aggressive and always on the move. Rivals keep a watchful eye on each other. If a stag sees the slightest chance of winning a fight, it will attack. Only the strongest stags can pass on their genes. The winner will father almost all the calves to be born next spring. By late September, all the females are pregnant. The males have done their part and peace can return. For most wild animals, the Morava River and its wetlands are not a barrier. On the contrary, for centuries, the flood plain has been a crossroads and a stepping stone for wildlife migrating between the Carpathian Mountains and the Alps. Up to the middle of the last century, lots of red deer would frequent this green corridor. Meanwhile, however, migration is down to a trickle. This boar is traveling an ancient route. He's coming from the Carpathians and heading to the Morava's woodlands but it's far from certain that he will ever get there. Through Central Europe's densely settled landscape, there are a few green corridors left. The big forest of Zahori, for instance, the flood plains of the Rodova River, or strips of woodland that have been left standing as wind barriers to protect agricultural land. These corridors enable the crucial flow of genes between wildlife populations. To reach the Morava's woodlands, the boar has to get past sprawling urbanization and industrial parks, across country lanes, railroads, and motorways. The journey is full of risks, and not just for the wildlife. For the long-term survival of the Morava floodplains wildlife populations, it's essential that migration corridors are restored and protected. Almost unnoticed, autumn has reached the wetland forest. The lush jungle green is fading. 
The Morava flow is now sluggish and silent, withdrawn into a narrow bed. The giant poplars are the first to lose their silvery green. Then the oaks turn brown. Willows and ash are the last to lose their leaves. The warmth of the sun is only felt for a few hours around noon. When the nights turn chilly, many birds who have nested here leave the floodplain. New arrivals from the Arctic take their place. In October, thousands of bean geese and greater white-fronted geese descend on the Morava's banks. They come from northern Russia and Scandinavia. Exhausted from their long flight, they rest and recover on the floodplain until the first severe frost moves them on again. In some years, their stopover is cut short. North winds can bring frost and snow by early November. When polar air flows in, temperatures can suddenly plunge way below freezing. It's so cold that nature seems to hold its breath. Not a trace of green is left. If the frost continues for several weeks, the river begins to freeze. The ice is still soft, but more and more of it comes drifting down the river. In the bends, the new ice builds up and gradually hardens until the Morava's gurgle fades into silence. The lush green wetland forest has turned hostile. It's now a white desert. The wild geese have drawn out their stopover as long as possible. Keeping their water holes open has become tedious, and in the end, the frost wins. One morning, as if by secret command, they take off to the south. In spring, on their journey back to the high north, they will touch down again. The only voices on the floodplain now are those of the crows. Even in winter, the water levels rises and falls, creating bizarre sculptures of ice. The Morava does not freeze over each winter, but when it does, the ice turns the river 
into a dream world. Carp and catfish glide silently below the ice. They do not hibernate, but their body functions are slowed down. Early March, one or two weeks before the equinox, the first migrant birds return from their winter quarters. During the most severe cold, the wild swans had been away at a nearby lake. But nothing keeps them there once the ice on the oxbow has turned thin and fragile. The forest canopy is still bare of leaves, so the spring sun can quickly thaw the dark forest floor. In the undergrowth, new life is stirring. The wild boar mother stays around the birth location until the little ones can run and follow her. For decades, the wild boar populations of Eastern Europe have been growing. In recent years, since winters have become milder, they have begun to push westward. After refreshments, the new energy has to be spent. It will be a long time until these two brothers will be mighty males, but a hierarchy will soon be established. After sparring, it's cuddling time again. In late March, the skies suddenly get noisy. The wild geese are back. The bean and white-fronted geese will soon continue on their journey north, but the grey lag geese have come to stay, mate and raise their young. Once a grey lag goose, male and a female, have become a pair, they'll stay together for life. That's the rule, but obviously not one carved in stone. If the first choice is not a happy one, the second or third might work out. The thick ice on the river takes much longer to melt than the frozen ground, but gradually the midday sun achieves more than the night frost and the river begins to flow again. Once the ice thaws from above and below, there's no turning around. The world's no longer rigid now. Things are moving. The Morava still pushes an enormous ice load. Again and again, the ice jams. But then, finally, 
the spell is broken. Just a day earlier, a wild animal could have crossed the river on foot. Massive as the ice cover was, the Morava crushed it within hours. Meltwater has filled the dips and hollows, and on sunny days, it quickly warms up. And soon, the water attracts life. Simultaneously, thousands of more frogs leave their winter quarters to meet at these pools. The males arrive first. During the mating period, which only lasts a few days, the males turn bright blue. When the females arrive, the mass mating starts. Then the spawn matures in pools and puddles until tadpoles hatch. But this year, things are different. Ice and snow have hardly melted when a huge rain front rolls in from the Atlantic all the way to Central Europe. The ground is already soaked from the snow melt. On top of that, it rains for days without a break, all across Czechia, Slovakia and Eastern Austria. The Morava drains vast areas in all three countries. While the pools on the floodplain are running over, more water comes from tributaries, even after the rain has stopped along the Morava's lower range. The lower Morava is like the neck of a huge funnel, the size of its entire catchment area. The water in the oxbows and in the floodplain is not just rising, it's shooting through old channels at a violent speed. Eventually, the inundation also engulfs the higher fields. The Morava has turned into a very wide river. In places, it's a hundred times wider than usual. The animals sense that this is not a normal flood. Floods like that occur once in a century. Now it's time to get out. It's a race against time. The hedgehog may be stranded for a few days, like a shipwrecked sailor, but at least he's among the lucky survivors. For days, the vast forest floor is several feet underwater. But as soon as the water level sinks, the first animals return. The flood has brought death and loss. But every disaster is also a new beginning. Floods clear and deepen the oxbows, create new channels and rejuvenate the wetland forest. As of yet, the Morava floodplain is still an untamed riverscape. 
a remaining wild sanctuary in the very heart of a cultivated continent. For many wild species, the Morava floodplain is more than an ideal habitat and a refuge. It's a vital link between populations east and west, north and south, the major stepping stone between the Carpathians and the Alps. The Morava does away with borderlines, between dry land and water, between countries and nations, between Europe's mountain ranges, and even between continents. The Morava is indeed a river without frontiers. <laughs>